If you have your Bible, please open um, your, the Bible to 2 Samuel chapter 3. We actually have a very big section to co- cover. You know, when I was coming up with the title for this sermon, the one first one that pops into my mind is doing the right thing. Now, doing the right thing is a takeoff of a movie title that appeared actually back in the late 80s, early 90s. It was actually the breakout movie for Spike Lee. It's called Do the Right Thing. And in that movie, it talks about the intersection of race, power, and you you throw sex into it. But it's how you actually, what do you do? It's mostly about racism. How do you do actually How do you do the right thing in the complicated world we live in? Now, this passage here is actually talking a lot about what it means to actually do the right thing. We're going this passage, we're going to look at how three different characters face the fact of doing the right thing, doing the just thing in their environment. But oftentimes, we will see the failures of our own human nature. And how much more we need the grace of God and the strength he provides for us in order to do the right thing. Okay, we're going to, have, we're going to look at the, the three characters here we will take a look at is David Abner, and Joab. And most of the chapter is going to center around Abner, what he does. And I want to to make a comment as we go through this about each one of these characters and the right thing or the wrong thing or what they should be doing for the right thing. Sam, I need some help. Oh, there you go. First of all, let me read to you the beginning of this passage. This is Abner's search for power and doing the right thing. While there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, Abner was making himself strong in the house of Saul. Now Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah, the daughter of Ayah. That's an unfortunate name, you know, in Chinese. And Ishbosheth said to Abner, Why have you gone into my father's concubine? Then Abner was very angry over the words of Ishbosheth and said, Am I a dog's head of Judah? To this day I keep showing steadfast love to the house of Saul, your father, to his brother, and to his friends. And I have given you into the hand of David. And yet you charge me today with the fault concerning a woman. God do so to Abner and more also if I do not accomplish for David what the Lord has sworn to him to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah, from Dan to Beersheba. And Ishbosheth could not answer Abner another word because he feared him. This passage opened up basically with Abner. And we understood from what we've been reading so far that there's a war going on between the house of Saul and the house of David. Now, the house of Saul was in power because of this man, Abner, keeping it in power. Now, here it says, while this battle was going on, Abner himself was secretly on the side trying to make himself strong. 
Now, how, does, how did he do that? The way he did that was that he went in. It says he had others married or had illegitimate relationship with Saul's concubine. Now, in the old days, the way you actually assert power, you assert your power through the uh, claim to the throne is to marry one of the king's wife or concubine. And that's what, that's what Abner did. You know, it's, it's like... It's a show of power. It's always down through the ages for man. If you have power, you marry a woman of status. And even though, you know, in a sense, we live in a different world today, it's still the same thing. You see, like the powerful man marrying supermodels. And this was like, this was probably a beautiful woman in her right. And the way he wants to show to the world is that he has, he's married to this beautiful woman. You know, on this past week, or this, you know, last couple of weeks, it's been on the news that the Amazon CEO was divorcing his wife for 25 years and marrying someone else. Well, you know, he talks about love. He talks about he, lose, he lost out of love and he's marrying someone else. Well, that's baloney. The reason he's able to do what he does is he's the richest man in the world. And he's trying to get away with doing that. So Abner himself is trying to get himself to be part of this throne. And Ishbosheth convicted him. And the reason why he knew he was doing something wrong is he flared up in anger. He blew up. And he says that, he says here, Am I a dog's head of Judah to this day? I keep showing steadfast love to the house of Saul, your father, to his brothers and to his friends, and have not given you into the hand of David. And yet you charge me today with all the, with the fault concerning a woman. You charge me with a small sin. And here it says this, God do so to Abner and more also, if I do not accomplish for David what the Lord has sworn to him to transfer the kingdom from the hand of Saul and to set up the throne of David over Israel and Judah from Dan to Beersheba. Now listen to this, these words real quickly. Saul, Abner have always knew that David was the anointed king. He knew that. If he had known that, the question is, why didn't he give the kingdom right away to David? It's because he wanted the kingdom for himself. And that's why you see that what he does in the end comes out. Even though he, say, he says he made a son of Saul, Ishbosheth, as king, he was really setting up himself. Now that his cover's been blown, he says, I want to go back and make David king. So this whole time, he was being a hypocrite. When we talk about doing the right thing, the first question you have to ask yourself is, why do you do what you do? You see here, Abner is quoting the Bible, the promise of God for him. But he quotes the Bible when it suits him. He knew the commands of God the whole time. But he only followed it when it suits his purpose. So the first question we have to ask ourselves when we, do, we, we talk about doing the right thing is, 
Why are we, for example, in church? Are we here just so we can be nice kids? Now, I know most of you are under 18. If I asked you why you're here, you would say, what? My parents made me come. Right, I know that. And same thing with pastor's kids. Um, but the question still is, why do you follow the Lord? What's Abner's reason for following the Lord? It's only, he only follows the Lord when it's convenient. He will serve his purpose first, and when it finally blows up, then he'll quote the Bible. That's a problem he had. Let's look at another part. Secondly, let's look at David for a second. Here's David's search for power. And Abner sent messengers to David on his behalf, saying, To whom does the land belong? Make your covenant with me, and behold, my hand shall be with you to bring over all Israel to you. Abner here again shows that he is the one who's fighting for power. He says, do you want the whole country of Israel with you? You need me. I will broker this for you. I'll bring the whole country under your control. Now, David has been a good man. He wants to follow the Lord, but he, sometimes he realized that he has to make these treaties. And he said, good, I will make a covenant with you. But one thing I require of you, that is, you shall not see my face until you first bring Michael, or Michael, Saul's daughter, when you come to see my face. Then David sent messengers to Ishbosheth, Saul's son, saying, Give me my wife, Michael, for whom I pay the bride price of a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. And Ishbosheth sent and took her from the hand of her husband, Paltiel, the son of Laish. But her husband went with her, weeping after her all the way to Bohurim. Then Abram said to him, Go return, and he returned. Now, here again is power. And here again. Women is involved. See, the question again is what it means to do the right thing. Now, here's the situation. David said, you know what, I'll make a covenant with you. But first you have to bring Michael, the wife that I had earned, and it says, paid dowry for by killing 100 Philistines. The question is, should he ask for her? In one sense, he still had the right to her, even though she was married to someone else. And the reason why was that he never divorced her. She was taken away from him when he was fleeing for his life and married someone else. And also, from a political standpoint, it makes sense. Why? Because if you want to get the whole nation together, what better way is to get the dead king's wife to be on your side? What? Yeah, yeah that, that king's daughter. This guy memorized the whole chapter. Okay, thank you. The king's daughter. To be your wife. And what, um, and even for Ishbosheth, it makes sense. Why? Because Ishbosheth is on the losing side of the battle. And usually, if you lose, what happened to you? What happened? Your head gets chopped off, unless you're related to the king. So it makes sense politically. It makes sense 
maybe emotionally, it may sense logically, and maybe even have, can justify yourself with Scripture. But was it the right thing to do? Now, the author didn't say exactly whether it was the right thing or the wrong thing to do, but look at this. What did it say? Included a very sad passage. It says what? It says, verse 16, but her husband went with her, weeping after her all the way to Bahurim. And Abner said to him, go return. And he returned. Who really cared for this woman? That's Paltiel. But somewhere under the politics of things, under the urgency of things, he gets crushed. Now, I will make the argument what David is doing is just collecting more wives. Let me read to you a part we did not get a chance to read last week, two weeks ago because I got, the sermon went long. Let me read chapter 3, verse 1. There was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. And David grew stronger and stronger while the house of Saul became weaker and weaker. And sons were born to David at Hebron. His firstborn was Amnon of Ahinoan of Jezreel. And the second, Chiliab of Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And the third, Absalom, the son of Maaka, the daughter of Talmai, king of Jashur. And the fourth, Adonijah, the son of Hagith, and the fifth, Shephathiah, the son of Abital. And the sixth, Ethrian of Igla, David's wife. These were born to David in Hebron. He has six wives. And each wife, he had one son. Now, I love what um, Matthew Henry said. Matthew Henry said he had one son with each wife. He says many men were able to um, do this with one wife and happily. I did this. And what it means is that what happened, we did this. What it means is that what happens is oftentimes, in David's case, it show that he was marrying these women for political status. One of them was a pagan wife, uh, was a king of, king of a neighboring country. One of them was, um, another one is um, someone of Jezreel. And three of the sons end up actually rebelling. You know, so David, I'm saying is wrapped up in the politics. It just reminds me, you know, a lot of hoopla around Phil Rivers. Did I say his name right? Quarterback of Chargers? Phil Rivers? Okay. Thank you. Um, there was an uproar in the news a couple of years ago because what? He has seven kids all from his wife. And you have professional athletes who have the same number of kids from different women, but nobody says anything. And because, you know, those other cases, men being men. And the same thing is happening to David here. And so what he does is that he takes something because of his want of power. And in a sense, he's crunch, you know, he's crunch Paltiel to do so.
And the question that we have is that as we live the Christian life, you know, we all have these competing forces in our lives of power, of desire, of loss, etc. What is going to guide your life? It is, must be the Word of God that takes front and center in our lives. Now let's take a look at Let's take a look at a little bit more at Abner. We need to switch to Joab. And here it says that Abner conferred with the elders of Israel, saying, Oh. And Abner, Abner conferred with the elders of Israel, saying, For some times past you have been seeking David as king over you. Now then bring it about, for the Lord has promised David, saying, By the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of all their enemies. Abner also spoke to Benjamin, and then Abner went to tell David of Hebron all that Israel and the whole house of Benjamin thought good to do. When Abner came with 20 men to David at Hebron, David made a feast for Abner and the men who were with them. And Abner said to David, I will rise and go and will gather all Israel to my lord the king that they may make a covenant with you, and that my, you may reign over all that your heart desires. So David sent Abner away, and he went in peace. It seems like everything's working great. You know, they're cutting deals, they're cutting deals. Everything is working great. I give you some power, you give me some power. Everything works great. But that's not true. Look at Joab's search for power. Just then the servant David arrived with Joab from the raid, bringing much spoil with them. But Abner was now with David at Hebron, for he had sent him away, and he had gone in peace. When Joab and all the army that was with them came, he was told Joab, Abner the son of Ner came to the king, and he has let him go, and he has gone in peace. Then Joab went to the king and said, What have you done? Behold, Abner came to you. Why is it that you have sent him away so that he is gone? You know that Abner, the son of Ner, came to deceive you and to know you're going out and you're coming in, to know all that you are doing. Let me read a little more. When Joab came out from David's presence, he sent a messenger after Abner, and he, they brought him back from his sister and Sarah. And we know the rest of the story. Paul read it. And basically, Abner came back. And because they made a covenant of peace, they made a deal. They help each other. Abner thought he was safe. But in the end, what did Joab do? He killed him. And he stabbed him in the stomach, actually in the same way that his brother Asahel died. Now, we could say, what Joab did was justified because he killed his brother. But what I want to say is that there's actually another angle. A lot of times we have to dig and dig and find out what's the man's motivation. Yes, he, he had to want to avenge his blood, but what, is, what happened? Asahel was killed in the battle. And Abner did not want to kill Joab's brother. He killed him because Asahel refused to get away from him. So Joab did not have a right to kill him. I think there's another reason why he killed him. We read earlier how suspicious Joab was. I think a man who is suspicious is often driven by envy. Once Abner made this deal with David, there's a pretty good chance that Abner could have a pretty high position in the military. 
and joy after now want that happen. And the easiest way to do get rid of that problem is to take him out. So here's a man who's marked by envy. And we can actually talk about a lot about what you do because you're jealous. Whether at work, in different departments, in school, what will you do? What if God made someone more gifted than you? How would you handle that? And last of all, Let's look at David's doing the right thing. David didn't know that Joab was killed. But after he found out, he set up this whole um, mourning procession. He had this lamentation for him. He actually made Joab and everyone else wear sackcloth and ashes, which was right. But the question I want to ask you is this. David said over and over again, That these men, for example, last verse it says that, and I was gentle today, though anointed the king. These men, the son of Zerai, are more severe than I. The Lord repay the evildoer according to his wickedness. What David said was, I can't do anything about them. Well, in a sense, it might be true. He was a young king. Maybe he can do much. But on the other hand, he is the king. If David had truly wanted to show that he was sorry for Abner's death, the least he can do is to remove Joab from commander. Why didn't he do that? He did not do that because he was afraid of his power being gone. I think he was also afraid because in this early stage of the kingdom, he still needed a lot of support. But his failure to discipline is going to show up again later in his life. Just like the fact that he took back his wife, Michael, for his own political gain, is going to show up later in his life. Where Michael is what despised him. See, I bring this out because the easiest thing for us to do in society today is to say, I don't have the power. We see a lot of wrong things in the world. Okay, even here in the church, we see a lot of wrong wrong things, but we can say, I don't have the power. We may not have all the power in the world, but we have a lot more power then we're willing to confess. See, by saying that you don't have any power, you excuse yourself for having to do anything. I remember, I mean, this closest thing we can think of, you know, back in World War II, let's go back in history. If you go back to World War II in Germany, um, one of the saddest stories I ever hear is that uh, when the Jews were being taken to concentration camp and they're hauled haul off like cattle into a train, and sometimes those trains would stop by a church on Sunday morning. And the Christians could hear the groaning, the crying for help of the Jews. 
What was their solution? The pastor would get up and tell them to sing louder. Well, after, you know, they can say we have no power while this is all government power, whatever. But they're now absolutely powerless. And that's what we have to face with today, brothers and sisters. We all have decisions to make every single day of our lives. And some of us, we're placed in a position of power. And even if we're not placed in a position of power, we all have our sphere of influence. What are we going to do given our sphere of influence? We have a choice. I can do it to further myself with power. I can do it. Maybe to even fulfill my own sinful desires. Or if I don't have the power, I can excuse myself. I don't have the power. Sometimes we do that. We don't ever want to be in a position of power because I can excuse myself for not wanting to do anything. But wherever we are, God has given us spirit influence. And what are we going to do in our lives to honor him. I want a couple passages. Mark 10, 40, 10, 45, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, but to give his life as a ransom for many. Oh, yeah. And let me ask, one passage. This is Colossians 3, 1 to 11. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above and not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passions, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you two once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one or the, another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of his creator. Here there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. So given what we have, this, these passages tells us to put on our new self, not our old selves. So given the life that we have, will we do the right thing? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. Thank you so much for your word. Help us this day, Lord, to do the right thing. First and foremost, Lord, to confess our sins, our need of you. Father, and help us, Lord to realize the spirit influence you've given to us and help us to live a life worthy of your calling. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. Can we all stand? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures.
May the grace of our Lord Jesus and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated after a moment of silent meditation. Service will be over. <laughs>